US is also now uh, looking at Indo-Pacific as the center of gravity. That's the real impact of this visit because it articulated an agenda for the future which is based on technology, cooperation and defense. Both of them have very in, uh, strong independent streaks in their foreign policy. Kind of wars that, that Russia, the, the, the Wagner group uh, has fought, the way they have fought it, they are ruthless. The French government, the French state has not been able to find uh, any institutional resolution to this crisis. Hello and welcome to the Ideas Factory. I'm Nagma. Joining me is Professor Harsh Pant. On this episode of the Ideas Factory, we will look at Prime Minister Narendra Modi's state visit of the United States and what changes does it bring to the India-US relationship? Does it take the India-US relationship to a new height? And um, what does it mean really for for uh, the global politics and uh, geostrategically, how important is this relationship? Uh, along with that, of course, the Egypt visit by Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Uh, how important is that if we look at India's relationship with the Arab countries? Uh, other than that, than that, very dramatic events had unfolded in Russia a couple of days back when we saw a brief rebellion by one of uh, Putin's loyalists, but the rebellion was also curbed. And now what? Has Putin emerged weaker after this? Rebellion, short-lived it was, but still. And how does it affect the, the Russia-Ukraine war? Uh, what does it tell us about Putin's future? All of that and, of course, the, the violent situation that we see on the streets of France. Those are the few things that we will be looking at on this episode. Let's begin with the India-US uh, visit, Harsh. Uh, you know, there have been visits by Prime Minister Narendra Modi earlier, but of course, this was a state visit. And, of course, there have been visits by other prime ministers, Indian prime ministers, to the United States. India-US relationship was on a good trajectory. But if we look at uh, this visit, where does this, this visit stand in the trajectory of India-US ties since the early 2000s? And how different was it? And why was it different from what was achieved earlier? Nagma, thank you. As you said, uh, you know, India-US relations have been on a positive trajectory for some time now. And uh, across uh, administrations in the US, across governments in India, across political parties in India, we have seen uh, a, a move towards strengthening this very important relationship. Uh, but I think, you know, uh, one has to give credit uh, to, to uh, Mr. Modi and, of course, to a certain extent to China for enhancing a relationship that perhaps would not have been this robust if not for these two factors. Uh, I think what happened is, uh, uh, you know, when you look at the last uh, year, nine uh, years of Mr. Modi, uh, when he went to the U.S. Uh, in 2016, he had articulated a vision. He had said that hesitations of history are over. Uh, and he had articulated this desire to have a, a relationship between, this, between two democracies, which can respond to the realities of the 21st century. And slowly but surely he worked towards that. You know, we gradually signed all the foundational agreements. We, we built our relationship uh, on, on defense and technology. Uh, we, Despite the Ukraine challenge of the last year and a half, we have seen that the relationship has not been derailed. Uh, so it, it's, it's, a, it's a tribute to, I think, the management of this relationship from both ends. Uh, but in the process, we've also seen China playing a very important role. Uh, had China not been this assertive, this aggressive, this violent vis-a-vis -vis India, Perhaps India would have been more cautious. Perhaps uh, you know the older paradigm in India would have uh, prevailed, and we would have taken uh, two steps forward and one step backwards. That kind of an approach, uh, which we which we were doing for a very long time. But I think, given the strategic environment around India, given the realities in the Indo-Pacific, given how uh, China is behaving and is likely to behave in the future, I think a strong partnership between India and the U.S., which Mr. Modi calls the most consequential partnership of the century, uh, perhaps uh, you know uh, became a strategic inevitability, uh, a, a veritable necessity for India and, and for the U.S. itself, because U.S. is also now uh, looking at Indo-Pacific as the center of gravity. They are also looking at uh, uh, establishing their own uh, position in the region and continuing with that position. Uh, they are also looking to push back against China. And when India and the U.S. come together, they can craft a balance of power in the region that serves these two nations, but also a number of other nations that perhaps are wary of China's rise and perhaps are wary of China's uh, assertiveness. So I think it is not simply a relationship between two big democracies or two big countries in the Indo-Pacific. It's, it's, it's also a relationship that underpins a lot of other relationships in the region and beyond. And I think that's the real impact of this visit because it articulated an agenda for the future, which is based on technology, cooperation and defense, two areas where some hesitations 
were still evident in the past. And I think the idea during this visit was to overcome those hesitations. And I think to a large extent, we have been able to do that. The kind of deals that we have signed, the kind of technology sharing agreements uh, that America is now pushing forth, I, I think is a testament to the changing realities in the US and in India. And in some ways, that will uh, be laying the foundations of a relationship that can again respond to, to contemporary realities. Absolutely, uh, Prime Minister Modi addressed the <clears throat> the joint um, you know Congress, and uh, it also showed the broad bipartisan support that there is for India. Uh, we saw many many significant deals in the sector of defense and space, the Artemis Accord, and all of that. But after that, you know, uh, this U.S. visit, of course, generated a lot of interest and excitement. And Prime Minister Modi received a warm welcome. Uh, this, it was a state visit. Of course, also the Indian community there was very, very excited and enthusiastic. But after that, he visited Egypt. And that was also a, a state visit. And he was accorded the Order of the Nile. Uh, we saw, uh, you know, the, uh, in terms of trade, it's been very important. If you look at the Suez Canal trade route, uh, he visited a mosque there where there was contribution of the Bora community, who is uh, very significant here in India, and they come from Gujarat. So a lot of interesting points there in the Egypt visit too. But there was a fear that it was overshadowed by the U.S. visit. But what really has been the significance of this Egypt visit vis-a-vis -vis our relation, India's relation with the Arab world? Uh, absolutely very very important visit and I, and before i come to that just let me you know uh, point out about the us visit and that one of the more interesting things about indo us relationship is that it is not driven primarily by state to state leadership you yes. know it is it is driven by so many stakeholders and as you mentioned the diaspora was so enthusiastic and the trade and e uh, economic sectors in the us are very enthusiastic today about india mm. uh, much more than they have ever been uh, you know you have the cultural side uh, the yoga day all of that, uh, you know, building up to this relationship. So there are so many stakeholders yeah. in the Indo-US relationship that I think that the relationship continues to move forward despite some of the challenges that it faces. And, and so even when the, the top level leadership may not be on the same page, you will have other actors that will propel the relationship. So I think Indo-US relationship that way stands on its own accord and, it, and it is, a, is in a category of its own. Uh, the the I think the change that we have seen in India-Egypt relationship in the last few years, we have seen a number of visits uh, by the Egyptian president in the last few years to India. Uh, and we have this visit coming after 26 years. Uh, uh, you know, No Indian prime minister had gone to Egypt for such a long time, which is again quite remarkable given that we, are, we have had a history of historical connect as well as the non-aligned um, connect um, for a very... Uh, you know, um, mm -hmm. so, so this, is, this, is, this is quite remarkable that we have not really paid any attention. But I think uh, uh, both India and Egypt were busy with their domestic preoccupations also. Egypt was also coming through a period of internal turmoil. It was also consolidating uh, state uh, structures. And I think under President Sisi, we have seen a consolidation happening. There is now stability in Egypt, uh, unlike uh, some of the previous decades. And in India, of course, we have seen a consolidation of a different kind. Uh, and now as India looks towards the Middle East, you know, this whole West Asia uh, North Africa uh, area that India is now trying to engage with on, on a different set of realities. India has built relationships with countries like UAE and um, uh, Saudis uh, of a very different order today. You know, it's, 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 it's again, it's a relationship that is responding to our realities of the day. So therefore, for, for Indian Prime Minister to go to Egypt and to articulate a very modern vision of this relationship, that let's not look backwards, let's look forwards about whether it is about, you know, the all of the sim symbols surrounding the visit, uh, modernity, inclusivity, uh, about uh, trade and investment, uh, all of that, I think, in some ways, speak to what is most needed, perhaps, in Egypt and in India. Hmm. That this is a relationship uh, that can, in many ways, uh, uh, help both India and Egypt uh, in reinvigorating and rechanneling some of our energies in ways that we have not done in the past. So when India talks of sea lanes of communication, we know what, you know, as you, as you were talking about, how critical Egypt can be in the whole Suez Mediterranean region where it plays such an important role. And as we look at the future of Middle East, as we look at the future of West Asia and North Africa, India's enhancing presence there would not reach its full potential without India-Egypt relationship reaching their full potential. So I think that point was well made. And, and the kind uh, and the, the reciprocity from Egyptian side is equally important because both India and Egypt, let's also remember, are also nations that want to retain their 
space uh, for maneuverability in, in, in this great power competition that is emerging. Both of them have very in, uh, strong independent streaks in their foreign policy. And I think that were also very visible. One of the interesting signs from Egypt has been to enhance defense ties with India, uh, co-production and co-development with India. I think that is something that we will have to really look forward to because, again, uh, India's uh, move towards uh, not only becoming and uh, not only being a defense importer, but also defense exporter and to co-produce and co-manufacture with other countries is going to be very, very important, especially in this region of West Asia and North Africa. Sure, absolutely. Uh, Egypt, of course, there has been a great Indian influence in terms of India's soft power in Egypt the yoga day, the yoga centers there, the Bollywood Connect, it's huge. And now, uh, I mean, absolutely, it's not very high, but Egypt's importance in uh, as far as India's relationship with the Arab world is, con is concerned, uh, it cannot be, the, it has to be really kept in mind that Egypt is a very, very important country there. Now, other than that, moving away from this topic, Harsh, if we look at Russia, that is something that uh, got everybody's interest. You know, everyone saw what happened in Russia as a rebellion by one of Putin's loyalists, a person who was Putin's chef earlier, Prigozhin. Uh, he leading the Wagner army and almost reaching Moscow, marching towards Moscow. There are many questions that arise from this uh, dramatic event. Why were they not stopped by the Russian army on the way where they were almost marching towards Moscow? And then how come the rebellion just dissipated? Where did the Wagner army then go? Uh, I, you know, how come Belarus negotiated this deal when Putin earlier was talking about uh, a revenge? Or And now, how does uh, Putin really emerge? Is it, Does he emerge as a weak leader? Has it exposed the weakness or the fault lines in Russia? There's a long war going on in that area. Uh, does it? Uh, what does it show? Uh, well, I think, you know, one of the things that might have been a very surreal experience to watch mm -hmm. those 24 hours on television. Uh, because, uh, you know, Putin had created an aura of invincibility for a very long time, especially, I think, in the context of his own domestic control over Russia. Uh, and so uh, what has been happening, unfortunately, I think for him is that over the last uh, year and a half, we have seen him uh, making, uh, you know, very obvious mistakes. And, and I think in some ways, the seeds of this, of this rebellion, of this mutiny uh, were laid by Putin himself. Because when you give a mercenary group mm -hmm. the authority to conduct wars on your behalf, on a state's behalf, I think you are ceding part of your authority, and I. And in some ways, uh, you know, when when uh, the Wagner Group and when uh, Prigozhin was uh, was uh, uh, boasting about his forces doing so so very well on the battlefield, while he was uh, grumbling about the lack of leadership from Kremlin, he was making a point about Putin's leadership. You know, he may not name Putin; he, he would name the defense minister, the Russian defense minister. But I think the target was Putin, and eventually, I think he started believing that if it is his forces that are winning, if, if it is he who is leading uh, uh, successful assaults on Ukraine, uh, then why can't he be more ambitious, perhaps challenge his own master? So I think that in some ways, Putin created a monster that came to bite him uh, later on. But the reality is that this crisis in the short term perhaps will boost Putin's popularity for a lot of Russians who want continued stability, who are afraid of chaos. But in the long term, it raises some fundamental questions, both in terms of Putin's control over the state apparatus, but also Putin's uh, ability to make right decisions. And here, I think mm -hmm. uh, I would also underscore that for a country like India that wants stable ties, strong ties with Russia, this is a huge challenge. Uh, you know, we we can we can all. Uh, wax eloquent about the importance of India-Russia relationship. But if Russia continues to be on this path of self-destruction, then there are limits to Indo-US relationship, Indo-Russian relationship. Okay. There are there are limits to what 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 I think uh, uh, India would be able to do with Russia given the kind of internal turmoil that Russia is facing. There's, there's one more question I have there, uh, Harsh, uh, but does that does that also do you think this was uh, this rebellion was like an internal crisis, or do you see any kind of uh, West's influence there? 
or support to Prigozhin's army? Because a lot of people have also spoken on this. Could he have done this alone? Or And also, was it like a warning to Putin from, Wag uh, from the Wagner group? Like they're fighting the real war. He was he has actually ceded authority. Now, if these people are fighting the war and winning the wars, then they should uh, be more ambitious. Was it like a warning? Uh, is it like a uh, West win there? I mean, we saw reactions coming in from the West. It exposes Putin's weakness. How do you see those points? See, it's, you know, if I mean, uh, only uh, someone with uh, you know. Uh, with some very serious information can credibly talk about these things and I'm mm. and people have made uh, very strong statements yes. on this but you know if you're looking at it empirically uh, and what has happened and what is also interesting is that if you you know Mr. Putin is very quick to blame the West but see his statement on television he did not blame the West he blamed Wagner he said that I created this group, we are supporting them, we are giving them resources and it's a stab in the back. So I think it's very evident that if he himself is not blaming the West, yeah. it's pointless to blame the West in this case because West, both, both, you know, uh, the, the choice is uh, not great in Prigozhin. Prigozhin is doing all, uh, you know, when you when the West talks about, uh, uh, you know, uh, war crimes, they're mostly talking about Prigozhin soldiers. They're not talking of Russian soldiers. Mm. The kind of wars that, that Russia, the, the, the Wagner group uh, has fought, the way they have fought it, they're ruthless. Uh, and so in some ways, uh, you know, uh, to, uh, to remove Putin and to have Prigozhin, there is not a choice that many in the West would like to make. Uh, I think that the, uh, they certainly, uh, when, um, uh, when the television was, uh, you know, was screening those images of, of uh, of uh, Prigozhin moving on to Moscow, trying to move to Moscow. Uh, some uh, some in the West would have been quite glad to see that happening within weekend. But I think it's a long-term disaster for, for the West if, the, if that would have happened. Uh, both in terms of uh, the uh, inherent instability it would have generated uh, within Russia, as well as uh, the, the inherent instability of, the, of a leader like Prigozhin. So I don't, you know, empirically it doesn't seem very viable to me that the West was behind this in a big conspiratorial way. Uh, to do to to dislodge Russia and and, and to be very honest, uh, Mr. Putin himself is not making those claims. At least till now, he has not made those claims. But Absolutely. I do think that this has exposed the vulnerabilities of of Mr. Putin, and that is something that I think most Western uh, uh, most uh, leaders in the in the in the West are underscoring that this is something that has that that has come out, and this will have implications for Russia and and by definition for Europe and for the West. Absolutely, it uh, does affect uh, the stability there. Like you said, in the short term, Putin's popularity has risen. In fact, people are rallying around him and people see him as this one force who's bringing stability to Russia. But how does it really affect in the long run? It also exposes the whole, you, you know, the the fallouts of raising those mercenaries uh, and, and sending them as fighters that we've seen earlier the Americans do in Afghanistan. We've seen that happen in Syria too. Now, um, just a last uh, question there on, on the situation that we see in France, Harsh. A lot of violence seen in the big cities like Paris, like Toulouse, like Lille. Uh, you know, all these cities are right now seeing police on the streets. There is violence and it exposes that uh, the unrest that has been there in the society, the migrants who've come in and have not really assimilated with the mainstream and are still on the outskirts. There are uh, accusations of discrimination, but there has been no solution. The problem, there is retaliation. The problem seems to be growing bigger. There are right now also accusations of racial discrimination. Uh, uh, you know, Nagma. In some ways, uh, this is an this is a structural and in, institutional problem for France, and uh, that this problem has been simmering now for decades. Uh, the French government, the French state, has not been able to find uh, any institutional resolution to this crisis. We know the kind of disparities uh, that that uh, uh, you know a certain kind of migration has engendered in in France and in in, in certain parts of Western Europe, and how the Western countries, in some ways, have not been able to find adequate solutions to these problems. Integration of certain communities has been very very poor, and that lack of integration also creates all these barriers 
uh, whether it is racial or whether it is economic or social, which uh, perhaps feed into such problems. And we have seen these problems emerge at regular intervals now. But unfortunately, we have not seen a resolution or a commitment on the part of Western governments to uh, especially in france uh, that uh, you know to, to resolve this problem and the police also uh, the way uh, you know we are seeing police in full force reacting uh, to to these to this crisis is quite stark you know if, if this were happening and let's be blunt if this were happening in india uh, we were we would be lectured about human rights and about how to uh, how to deal with minorities and how to uh, uh, how democratic you can be or you cannot be and this is something that if you if you look at russian streets today the kind of disaster that is unfolding uh, is, is, is quite uh, remarkable. I mean, for, for a country of India's diversity, we have always had protests, but, but this is you know, staggering in the scale, violence, the inability of the state structures to respond. Uh, and in some ways, I think uh, uh, we have also not seen a reasonable political response. I mean, uh, Emmanuel Macron, for example, has said that, look, uh, uh, this uh, he's uh, the... Uh, uh, it is being pull, it, the, it, he, the, the 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 person who died is being used as a tool by the writers, etc. Now, this is not the kind of language you would expect from uh, you know from a democratic leader who has to actually control uh, the situation. So, I don't think there is a there is a consensus as to what is the best way. Is it a law and order problem, or is it a structural mm -hmm. institutional problem? And I think somewhere there is a division in the in the in the, in, in, in in France at the moment as to how do you go forward in tackling this crisis. But this requires a long-term solution because if not, then we will keep on seeing these episodes recur uh, time and time again. Absolutely. The 17-year-old Algerian boy who was killed at the hands of a policeman sure is being used as a tool, but then there is an underlying bigger, deeper problem because of which the violence erupted the way it did on the streets of France in all the big cities. And like you point out that we have to look at the problem is that a law and order problem? Is that an institutional problem? And it has to be sorted out because time and again, the, these incidents have erupted there. Thank you so much, Harsh, for your analysis and your take on these various very important issues. Thank you all for watching.